This is Warner Sable. I'm a construction attorney and architect in Chicago. I'm also an arbitrator and mediator. In these videos, I discuss arbitration and mediation topics. Now, an important issue in arbitrations, especially for the parties, is the type of award that they're going to see at the conclusion of the arbitration. And typically, this is something that should be discussed right at the very first conference call between the arbitrator and the attorneys for the parties once that arbitrator is appointed. Uh, now, this can be revisited later on, but at least some sort of understanding should be reached at the outset of, of this process. Now, there's three basic types of awards in arbitration. First, there's the, the standard award. This is something that uh, we used to see in the old days. And basically, it's a very short form of award which says party A gets X dollars and, and that's pretty much it. So it's a couple of lines. There's a winner, there's a loser, there's an amount, uh, and that's it. And the, the thinking behind it was that the less you said, the less vulnerable that award is to any sort of uh, judicial intervention later on. Uh, practically nobody uses that type of award anymore. The the associations, such as the American Arbitration Association, uh, discourages that. So the second type of award is the, is the much more common, the, the reasoned award. And what that is, is a, a breakdown of the, the claims and the, some basic reasons behind the, uh, the award for each of those claims. So in a typical arbitration uh, involving construction, you're going to have uh, a series of discrete claims such as uh, the roof leaks, the windows leak, uh, there's this problem with the paint and, and so forth. And so each of these elements of a construction claim are going to be uh, have their own set of damages and their own set of proofs and, and so forth. And so a reasoned award then will go through each individual item and uh, provide a, uh, an award for the roof, for instance. Uh, the arbitrator may decide that the, the window leak, uh, if there is a window leak, was actually a design defect caused by the architect and not the contractor. So the owner's not going to get an award against the contractor for that item and hopefully this will be uh, explained to some degree in the reasoned award. And at, at the end of that reasoned award, there's a, a dollar figure that uh, is, you get to by adding up all the, the pieces that you've had uh, before that. And the final and by far the most expensive and complicated type of award is findings of fact and conclusions of law. Now, this is something that you would expect to see in court. A court case often results in a judgment that contains findings of fact and conclusions of law. And, there, and there's reasons for that. The, the judge uh, puts this together because it's, there's a, a good likelihood that the party that loses this case is going to appeal that uh, that judgment. And if the appellate court can't figure out what the judge was doing, it's, uh, there's problems. So if the judge lays out uh, all the findings of fact, he believes this witness, he thinks this, this fact was proven, that fact was not proven, and so on, 
and conclusions of law, what law applies, how the, the law applies to this particular case, and so forth. And that roadmap then becomes the basis for an appellate court's review of the case. And uh, so th this is something that you find takes a lot of work. And if the parties in an arbitration want something like that, then uh, I, I tell them, look, this is going to be very uh, expensive, much more expensive than uh, certainly a standard award, but a reasoned award doesn't take that much time to put together. Findings of fact and conclusions of law do take a lot of time, and the parties are paying by the hour for that. So that's something that the, the clients really need to know. And the question for me then is, why would an attorney want findings of fact and conclusions of law? The, the only real reason versus a reasoned award that explains how you got there is uh, to possibly take it up on appeal. Now, uh, attorneys that are experienced in construction and, and are sophisticated are going to know that an appeal is uh, virtually impossible to win uh, of, of an arbitration award, especially if you have a, a competent arbitrator who knows how to write an award. Uh, there's virtually no chance of, of overturning that. So why do you need findings of fact and conclusions of law? Now, if, if the attorneys tell me that's what they want, uh, they'll get that. But, you know, it's, uh, to my mind, they're wasting their clients' money. But again, if, uh, to the extent that the, the parties agree on something in the arbitration, unless it's totally unreasonable, I'll go along with it. Arbitration is a creature of contract and agreement. And to the extent the parties agree, that controls. So uh, I would suggest that a reasoned award is what most clients want and is the most uh, reasonable thing to, uh, to provide the parties from where I sit as the, the arbitrator. So I discussed this at the outset. And so what happens if the parties really can't agree on the type of award that they want. One party wants a standard award, another party wants a reasoned award, or, or one of them wants findings of fact and conclusions of law and, and so forth, and they, they simply can't agree. So if you have an arbitration that's being administered by the American Arbitration Association, their rules are generally incorporated into your contract. And I believe some of the other form contracts will uh, incorporate the rules of whatever other association you're using. And so, uh, as an example, the, the AAA, their rules say that in the event that there's no other agreement, the arbitrator shall provide a concise written financial breakdown of, of any monetary award unless waived by agreement. So the parties can agree otherwise, but if they don't agree, then the arbitrator is supposed to provide this concise written financial breakdown of any monetary award. It doesn't mean you go into a lot of detail as to what witnesses were believed, what evidence uh, was more reliable than, than other evidence, uh, and so forth. I try to do a little bit more than that, even, even for a, a reasoned award, I'll try to give some explanation, not just of the numbers, but how I got to those numbers and why they may be different than what the parties were looking for. So that's something to consider. And again, I think most reasonable attorneys will uh, agree on a reasoned award and, and leave the rest up to the arbitrators uh, best judgment. Now, when, when can you expect to receive the award? You, you've had the, the hearings and they're closed and uh, when, when do you get that award? So basically, again, under the, the AAA rules for small cases, the, the rule is that uh, from the time of the close of the hearings, the arbitrator has 14 days to prepare the award. For larger cases, it's 30 days. Now, again, this can be changed by agreement. And 
if I'm the arbitrator, toward the close of the hearing, maybe on the last day of the evidentiary hearings, uh, we'll have a quick discussion as to what that should be. And the reason for doing that is that uh, oftentimes I'm involved in a, in a slightly more complicated case where you have maybe uh, 10 claims and, and five counterclaims, maybe there's three or four parties. Uh, it, it, for some reason, it's, it's more complicated than uh, you, you might otherwise think. And uh, sometimes the parties will have retained court reporters for their own purposes. Uh, and generally, if the parties do have court reporters, I'll ask for a copy of the transcripts because that, again, for a complicated case that lasts many days, that, that does help me generally in putting the uh, award together. So I'll talk to the parties and say, look, uh, we've had 18 days of hearings, we, we've had 20 witnesses, and uh, you know, to really put this together is going to take me a little bit more than 30 days. Does, uh, does anybody have a problem with me taking 45 days, 60 days, wh whatever may be appropriate? And uh, I've never had any pushback on doing that. Uh, generally, it's, it's taken several months to get to this point anyway, so a few more days isn't going to make uh, any kind of uh, big difference. So again, that, that time is, uh, the starting time is the close of the hearings. There's a point at which I officially close the hearings. Now, wh when does that happen? It's not necessarily on the last day when we're all together and I hear from witnesses. Sometimes the parties will ask to present post-hearing briefs. Not uncommon in, in more complicated cases. And I find that actually post-hearing briefs in complicated cases are sometimes very helpful. And what's even more helpful for me is a, a detailed claims summary from each of the parties. So what, what happens is at the start of a, an arbitration, at the start of the case, when I first get appointed, uh, I'll generally get uh, an outline of the, the claims, uh, the roof leaks, the, this, this happened and I want 100,000 for this and I want a million for that and, and so forth. And that gives me sort of a, a handle on what the case is about. But what, what sometimes happens is during the course of this whole process, additional things have come up. And so when I hear testimony, now there's testimony about, you know, this, this roof leak was way more extensive than we originally thought. So instead of 100,000, uh, we had to pay 500,000 to get it fixed. Uh, but the, the window leak, we determined it was it was really the architect's fault. So we're taking that out of our claim. And so you don't have to consider that. So what I will want, especially in a case where those sorts of things have happened, I'll want a, a revised claim breakdown from the parties. And they will, I'll give them a week or two or whatever time they need to pull that together. And then once I receive that, and if there's post-hearing briefs, once I receive those, once I get all this stuff in, then I close the hearings. So they, they don't close until all the evidence and all the briefs and all the, the stuff that the parties intend to submit to me uh, until that's actually submitted. And at that point, the, the clock starts running on the award. And the, uh, the award then hopefully, will be uh, the finality to that case. That award then can be, generally what happens after an award uh, is, you know, somebody may be unhappy about it, but they, uh, you know, they'll, they'll wind up paying the award and I never hear any more about it. Occasionally the award is challenged. Uh, I've never had an award actually overturned by a court, uh, so, you know, the parties are, again, I think are wasting their time doing that. But um, the, the case for all intents and purposes is, is over at that point. And hopefully the, the parties can go about their lives uh, 